Good afternoon to everyone joining in today. We'll just give it one minute to see who joins in our session and uh, then we'll go ahead and get started. Just a minute for everyone to get settled and jump in. Okay, that's one minute past, so let's go ahead and make a start. So welcome to our fortnightly webinar series, and today's topic is quick wins when just starting out. Um, so this will be good if you are new to the eSkilled platform and just outlining some things that will help you at the very outset. Um, a brief introduction to me. Uh, my name is Hayley Zeinstra, and I am the Customer Success Manager at eSkilled. So that is who will be presenting for you today. Now, today we are using our platform GoToWebinar. If you haven't used this before, um, you should see in the top right corner of your screen um, the following uh, icons. And if you would like to ask a question at any point today, you can click that question mark icon. Um, what that will do is open um, a side menu for you and then once that is opened, you'll be able to see at the bottom corner of the page, the box where you can type in your questions. So please don't hesitate to send those through if there's anything that you would like to ask. So just to reiterate, our topic for today is five quick wins uh, when starting out. So that's five things that you should be prioritizing right at the beginning to make your life as easy as possible as you start to adopt the eSkilled platforms. So let's dive straight into it. Number one, um, we recommend that you do create your people. Um, so that would be your users in the system. So a few points to raise on the screen here. Number one, no access, no use. So if your team can't access eSkilled, you can't expect them to learn it and use it. So Priority number one would be to set up an account for any of your staff who will be using the platform. Um, and when I talk about uh, your people or your users, that would be your administration users um, or your trainers who will be users in the platform. Let's expand on that idea a little bit. Um, so why is it so important that you do create users? We want your team to have some buy-in and we want them to learn the system and feel confident in how to use it. So while there is an element of teaching and instruction in the form of the onboarding training, um, you also want the team to have some ownership and buy-in here. And the way we can give that to them is um, having them with the option to, or with the ability to log in and explore. So that's a huge asset is just going in there and making that a priority to create your users at the start. Um, so you can leverage that because they can help you then with your account setup. So by having them come in and help, you're going to ultimately adopt the platform much quicker. Now there's a few settings and we'll go into the system and dive into these. Um, it is helpful if you've got the SMS and LMS subscription where you're utilizing the student and the learning management that you create the student management profile first because we have an option there where you can automatically create an LMS user profile at the same time. Um, so you only create one profile, but it will generate the entity or the identity in both systems. Um, you've also got the option for a dual user role or dual role user. Um, so someone who might be an administrator and a trainer and a few other settings there as well, um, options to keep in mind as you are creating your users and what kind of access you think they may need or you may want to grant to them. So let's jump across uh, into the eSkilled system now. And what we'll do is just go through that process on how you can add a user into the system. 
So first of all, um, you'll want to navigate using the main menu on the left side of the page to people. That's where you set up your people and your users. And what you can see here is the drop down box, which is your library of users who already exist in the system. Um, so if you're brand new, that might be relatively empty. Um, what you'll want to do uh, is click the add button so that you can add in the details of a new user. Now there's a few panels across the page. You've got first of all, the access information panel. That's the most important one really. Um, and there are some fields you'll see that have that little red asterisk next to them. And those are your mandatory fields. You have to populate them to create the account. Um, if I explore the page a little bit, you can see there's quite a lot of fields. Um, they're not, majority of them are not mandatory. So it's up to you if you think this is information which you would like to record in the eSkilled system, go ahead and populate those fields. Um, and if that's not something that you necessarily want to do, um, then obviously just focus then on the mandatory ones so that you can create the account. Now, most of the important ones are here in this access information panel. Um, and the first field we have here is a password. So we need to assign a password for this user. Um, so you can see here in the little black box pop up, it's letting us know what the minimum security requirements are when creating a password. So that's eight characters, it must have a capital letter, it must um, have a number and a special character or a um, a symbol in it as well. So just make sure when you are setting up your password that it does meet those requirements. Then you've got next to that, and I'll go left to right like you're reading a book. Um, this is your system access. So what sort of access does this person need to have for the system? So the choices there would be an administrator user or a trainer user. And like I mentioned, you can do a dual role. So we'll come back to that. Maybe just to start with, we'll uh, imagine we're adding an admin user. The next drop down box, this is an optional one. I don't really recommend changing it, at least in the beginning. This is the home page. So when you first log into eSkilled, um, what page would you see as your first landing page? The default option here is to come to the dashboard. Uh, there are options here to change that so that you see your tasks also that you see the schedule. Um, and unless you feel like that is immediately very interesting to you, I would probably just leave that at dashboard. Now, the next two fields, they work together. That's your LMS username and your LMS password. These only need to be filled in if you have already got user credentials set up for this person in the LMS system. So the purpose of these fields there, that's to connect the two. So you've got an existing LMS account. We're now creating you a brand new SMS account and we want the two accounts to be linked together. If you don't already have one, they should be left blank because um, there's nothing to connect to per se. And more likely, and this is what I recommend you do, um, you use this box here to auto create a user profile in the LMS. So the default option is set to no. So you'll want to change that to yes. Um, so we don't already have this person set up, but we would like to create them in both platforms. And like I mentioned, when we had the slides on the screen, it is easier to do that if you do it in the SMS because uh, there's less legwork. You only have to set it up one time and your user is going to get access for both systems. Now, when we're using this option here to auto create, this is where the next two drop down boxes would be relevant. So we've got LMS role and LMS trainer role. So the default options here, if you did not select anything, would be an LMS role of a student and an LMS trainer role of a trainer. So what these boxes essentially allow you to do is to customize the default option. So if this person you're setting up is a manager, maybe they shouldn't necessarily have student access to the LMS. You want them to have 
manager access to the LMS. Or maybe if it's a particular, um, and it's probably more relevant if you had system access set as trainer, that their trainer role might be as um, a particular type of mentor in the system rather than a standard trainer. So these are for an override only. If you would be happy with that person simply having a student access and simply having trainer access, you can leave both of those blank and uh, there's no need to set up the override options. You can also change these later in the LMS system too. So if you need to change the permissions for a user, that's still something you can toggle. It's um, no issue if you haven't maybe set it up correctly at the outset, you can go back and change that. So just to summarise there, if uh, you already have an LMS user account, you would be putting the username and password for that account into the fields there. And the purpose is to connect your SMS and LMS accounts. If you're creating the user for the first time, um, it's best to select auto create user as yes. Um, and then all you would need to do is if there is an override desired for the particular role and that relates to permissions and access in the LMS. Um, so if they should have higher permissions and access, you would just change the role here. All right. Um, so we've got these toggle boxes as well. Um, and the first one here, uh, this is for your dual role users. So if this is an administrator user who also provides training and would deliver training, you'd simply turn that on and toggle that to yes. You've also got a privacy filter. Now this relates to what level of student information that this user is able to see. Um, so if you turn it on, they are restricted uh, and in terms of privacy, they cannot see um, student phone number, student address, all their personal details. Um, those are all hidden to this user. So they'll only be able to see the student name and then anything that relates to their training and enrollment. So um, what enroll, what course are they enrolled in? What units are they enrolled in? What you know, um, enrollment status do they hold? What date did they finish their units? They can still see all that information, but just those personal contact details are hidden. You've got a toggle there as well to enable two-factor authentication for this user account. Um, you can toggle this at a more universal level as well, but um, right here you've got the person by person option. So Two-factor authentication is, of course, that additional layer of security where you would have a uh, PIN code uh, message to your phone or device um, and you need to provide that PIN code in addition to your username and password to successfully log into the eSkilled account. And finally, um, this one was turned on by default because we are assuming since you're creating a new user that you would like them to be an active user. So this is really important if um, perhaps it's a now defunct user, someone who's maybe left your organisation and no longer working there, um, where you would toggle that to um, show as not active any longer. But that's a good rundown of the technical setup items in the um, access information panel. Now, there are some slightly different ones if you are creating someone whose system access is set to trainer. So let's look at what those would look like. Uh, where you see that difference, it's here with the home page. So um, home page itself uh, for a trainer, you've got the option there to use a schedule as the um, home page rather than the dashboard. So the schedule is, uh, you know, more consequential to your um, to your trainer users because uh, they will be wanting to see when, where, what time are they delivering that training. Um, the other options that we see change is this one here. So we have a drop down box rather than a toggle. Um, and this is whether you want that trainer to uh, be shown employers and the options there are either no as the default or you can toggle that on to yes. 
If you do toggle on to yes, what that essentially uh, allows that trainer user to do, they have access to your company's menu item when they log in as a trainer. So they're able to see exactly what we're looking at here. They can see this drop down box that has a list of all your companies. Um, they can open up the details of a particular company. They'd be able to see who are the contact people, um, including phone numbers, um, names and email addresses. They can see just the company details such as location. Um, so if this is uh, something that you find that your training staff may need to be aware of, if they perhaps go on site and deliver training, potentially rocking up at a venue that has a locked gate, it might be helpful if they can go into the organisation, um, if they can look at the company contacts, see the key company contact and maybe give them a call to have um, gates opened or unlocked or access granted or whatever that might be. So that's sort of the intention there with the option to allow your training staff to see the company's menu item. Now, uh, I did navigate away, which was a bit silly. If we go back to clicking add as if we were adding a new user to the system, the other mandatory fields uh, that have the red asterisk that we need to supply to create an account, that would simply be a name, a surname and an email address so that that person uh, has an entity and can log in. But I would recommend this is one of the first steps that you do as you prepare um, to start using eSkilled. So create all of your users in the system. Um, make sure that you give them the details, uh, their username and password so that they can log in and they'll be a great asset for you, your team in helping get started because they now will have access to go in there um, and help you get started and learn the system and look around for themselves as well. Okay, um, number two. Build your email templates. So um, I guess in terms of correspondence that comes out of the system, particularly the written correspondence points, um, you can build those as templates in eSkilled and um, we'll come to this a little bit later, but you can also automate a lot of that correspondence to go out as well. So in order to sort of utilize that really great aspect of the system, you need a number one um, on this slide here, have a bit of a plan and a brainstorm um, with your team. Um, what are those contact points that you're gonna have with students? What is the correspondence you need to send? Um, and I would suggest that you sit down together and write a bit of a list. So what are those things? Is it a confirmation email? Um, or is there an application process? Do they need an approval? Do they need um, a receipt for payment? What are you sending out to them? It's good to identify what all those parts are. Um, and once you've identified what they are, you can write the email templates and that becomes a lot easier. So you have a bit of a plan, you know all those um, pieces of communication that need to go out, you can sit down and write them. So let's jump across to the system again and let's show you where you can set up your email templates. So again, navigating with that main menu on the left, um, you'll want to go to administration. That's our expandable menu. And once you've expanded that, you can see the templates menu item. Once you've got that open, we have our second layer of navigation and the top of the page. Click on the email templates tab. And this is where you can see your library of templates, create new templates and so on. So uh, in terms of the library, that's everything in this um, scroll bar here. So we've got a rather extensive library in there. Um, to add a new template, you would just be clicking the add button over here next to the library drop down box. And you've got a clean slate where you can start drafting um, the email templates that you want to create in the system. So um, don't limit yourself to uh, the bare bones and basics. You can get a bit more creative and make it you know, visually appealing for your students in here. Um, 
So I guess to start with the beginning, you need to give the email a name and that's so you can find it in that drop down list when you're looking through your library of templates. And then you've got the email subject. So that's obviously the subject line that will be used when it's emailed to a student. Well, I guess I'll give one here. And that could be what confirmation of enrollment or anything that you might need to send out. You've got an email type here and uh, for the most part, you don't need to assign an email type if it is general correspondence. The purpose of the email type drop-down box is where you have uh, a template that you would use for one particular scenario in the system. Um, so for example, that might be a password reset. You would only have one template that you use for password resets and by uh, selecting password reset in the um, drop down box here, you're saying that this is the um, type um, of email that is going to be dispatched from the system. This is the one corresponding template that will go with that type of action. Um, so if I try and select that right now, I'm, that this is what would happen. You would get an error because we've already got one set up. You can't create multiple templates with the type of um, password reset. So what you would need to do is either uncouple <laughs> the existing template uh, so that you can create another one and assign it to the email type of an email of a password reset rather, uh, or just go and edit the existing template. So um, I just wanted to make sure we explain what email type is used for there. But for the most part, um, you would just leave that blank if it's general correspondence that's going out to a student. Um, and then importantly, this is your text editing field. So you're going to have all the information um, of that email, obviously, in the box here. Uh, if you're not already familiar with dynamic fields, um, we've got a drop down box there um, and you have a whole range of different, I guess, fields of data that we can pre-populate based on details that are coming from the system. So as a very simple example, if we wanted to start our email and we want it to say dear and then the name of a student, we can use a dynamic field to do that for us automatically. Um, so if we click on our dynamic fields drop down box, they are in alphabetical order and I am here looking for a student name. There we go. You can see what that has done ultimately is put student name uh, in a curly bracket next to my uh, beginning of the sentence by saying dear student name. And now this is going to depend on what the student supplied as a name when they enrolled into the training. So if I had enrolled, it's going to say dear Haley. If someone else um, by the name of Samantha has enrolled, it will say dear Samantha. So um, that's a really great way to create your suite of emails that are generic, um, but can be used in a wide range of applications. So um, for details that you might want to pull out of the system, it might be personal details that the student has supplied about themselves, like their name or their date of birth. Um, it might be information about the training which you have set up in the system. So the program name, um, the event start time, all those sorts of items are what you will see here in your dynamic fields list. Um, it might be information about your RTO creating a bit of a signature at the end. So you've got your RTO name as an option there. You might want to include uh, what are they enrolled into. So um, the name of the program or the unit that they've enrolled into. So plenty of options through there to help you build out your template and information. Um, now, finally, once you've saved your uh, beginnings of the template, now I've clicked that save button and added it in, you can see we've got the option below here to add some attachments. And there's two places you can do that. Um, I recommend, generally speaking, using the bottom option here for your system email attachments. 
And the reason why is because these attachments can be used across the entirety of the eSkilled system when you are generating an email. So that might be when you're using a template, it might be ad hoc to an individual, um, but you're just sending them a one-off email. Any of the e uh, documents in your library, those will all be available to utilize as an attachment on that template that you are sending out or on that ad hoc email that you are sending out. Now, anything that's attached in the top box here, yeah, your email attachments box, these ones are only able to be sent when you are sending the particular template that is open here. So anything attached in email attachments is only relevant when you're sending email um, template example one. So there's just a, a wider range of applications for your system email attachments. Now, if you want to use a system email attachment, you would just click the attachments drop down box and then you can see all of the files that you have available in the library and you can add them as an attachment. And you can see when it does that, it does look very similar to the dynamic field tags. Um, if I just put a bit of a space in between these so it's a bit clearer, you can see that's got two of the curly brackets instead for the documents there. Um, so those are the basics. I, and I think I did say at the beginning, don't be limited to a very boring text email. Make it a little bit exciting. You do have the opportunity here to insert uh, pictures. So you can find an image um, from your uh, device or cloud storage or wherever you upload that from um, and use images. So put your logos in there brand your um, correspondence, make it visually engaging for your students. Um, you've also got links. So if you wanted to um, have a lovely footer, perhaps, or header for the email um, that has links out to your website and other maybe resources, uh, you've got the option to do that as well. Um, and if you do have anyone who uh, is good with the HTML coding to make it extra fancy, uh, you can do that within the text editor here as well. Um, so you can take full control um, and code that out exactly how you would like it. Um, but highly recommend, um, you know, using a bit of visual imagery in your um, emails just to break it up and make it easy to engage with for your students. And um, I guess with that, we can go back to our slides, but creating a really robust um, library of templates is helpful so that you have that planned out and ready uh, to send out to students. And this is almost the extension, I suppose, of actually writing the templates and knowing what those correspondence points are. But um, you can automate uh, via a couple of methods here uh, to send out those emails from the system automatically so that you're not having to click a button and do that. Uh, they just go according to the rules that have been set up in the system. So that is the really powerful reason behind wanting you and encouraging you to draft your templates and have them written and ready to use because uh, that's a really great way to gain some efficiencies with the system. Of course, you can still send those same emails out manually if they are something that you really want to trigger um, with a, a human um, pushing the button and making sure that that's following a particular procedure or such. Um, alrighty. And just some ideas here, really, um, of what those email templates might be that you need to start brainstorming with the team, writing down your list of what they are, um, and then ultimately drafting the, the content of those emails too. So like I mentioned already, starting from confirmation emails, you might have helpful fluffy ones like tips on how to study, reminders to attend class so that you have better attendance rates. Um, you might even reach out to students as a courtesy if they're missing class to try and engage them and help follow up if there are issues. Um, sending out the certificate, um, feedback, uh, reviews, asking students to provide that sort of information back to you. Um, and for your training where they might want to come back again, uh, maybe automating a reminder uh, to come back and do more training or refresh training where that might be appropriate too. 
So plenty of options there just to get you started um, on your own planning. All right. Number three, utilize your iframe codes. Now, um, I'm not sure how savvy everyone in the webinar today necessarily is, but don't let the word iframe scare you. Um, we're going to talk about website and code though, just to forewarn you. So um, what does an iframe do and why do we encourage you to use it so much? It lets you embed content from external sources and in this case, we are the external source, that's us at eSkills, um, onto your web page. And the main thing that we're thinking about here is to embed the enrollment form so that you can capture student details and have that immediately in your eSkilled account. So that's the benefit to having it on your web page is that a student can interact with the enrollment form and then they are immediately um, set up and created in the eSkilled uh, student management system for you there too. Um, so yeah, that is the main purpose. That's why you would want to use it because uh, it's the most efficient way to get your students registered and into the system. There are some other iframe codes we have available too. Um, so there is certificate verification and the AQF surveys that you can iframe to just to mention, but today we will be focusing on the enrollment form. So what does it look like? How do you use it? They're great questions. So let's jump into the system and we will take a look. So let's move to system. Where can we find the iframe code? That's a great question in itself because there's a few different ones you can use. There's a universal one that's available in the administration menu and by visiting settings. And it's the second button for enrollment code. So you can see when you click the button, it lets you know that it has copied iframe to the clipboard. And what does that look like? Um, I'll show you just shortly. Let's uh, open up a website that's going to give us the ability to preview the code. Because um, I'm sure a few of you have seen a website code before or HTML code before. Um, I'll just bring that up on the screen here. Uh, this is what it looks like on the left. So not very useful to you and me. Uh, it just looks like a whole bunch of plain text, not something that we can interpret. Um, but what this website is letting us do is preview what that would look like if it was on a website. So the right hand side here, that's the output. So if I take away the example that this website has built into it and remove that, and then if I was to click run, what we should see is blank uh, on the side here as well. But what I'll do now is paste in that iframe code that was copied to my clipboard when I clicked the enrollment code button. So this is now in the clipboard. So I can now use the paste function uh, to paste that in, which is what I've done here. Uh, and then we can click run. And what we'll see on the right side of the screen is ultimately the output. So this small piece of code, not very interesting or informative to look at on its own, but when it is installed on a website, this is what it actually is showing. And this is the enrollment form or the external enrollment form as we call it. So this is how your students can visit your website, see and interact with the form here. They can pick a course that they are interested in um, studying. Uh, they can find a particular delivery and pick a date where that is set to run as well. Once they've made their selections within that form, it's sending them down the rabbit hole a bit further and collecting their personal information. Uh, so all the questions that we want them to fill in, um, personal questions about themselves. Um, it's got the declaration that we want them to attest to and they need to decide who's going to be paying for the training as well. Um, will that be them or are they nominating an employer? So depending on the settings that you've set up at course level, this may look and feel a little different. Um, but the premise is that you want to build this in on the website and utilize this iframe code so that students can visit your website and do this uh, self-serve. They don't need to um, 
call you up, they don't need to ask any questions, it's just nice and easy for them to go to the website and uh, register their details and ultimately enrol into the training. So um, let's go back to the slides. And hopefully, ultimately, what you've understood from that is that number one, you know what does that iframe do now? Um, and you also know why it's useful to use it, um, because it does give your students the ability to visit the website and enrol themselves. Um, and putting it on your website early just means even if um, you don't have any courses open, you can turn those settings off at the um, program and the program instance level so there's nothing available for them to book into. But having that set up early just takes the, the rush and the stress out of doing that later down the line. Um, you could even put it on a page on your website that's not open to the public until you pull it on to the website design, but having it actually ready to go just means that as soon as you are ready to accept students that it's already done and you've sorted that out, you've tested it, you know it works uh, and you're ready to go. All right, um, why is this now sitting in a frame? Yeah, that will have to do. I guess enroll yourself is the next step here. So do a test enrollment. Um, the reason that we say that, it's the best way to preview your student experience. You'll get to see exactly what they would. So that's where if you've already utilised that iframe code and put it on your website, you can pretend you are a student, go to your website, fill in the form and really experience the student journey exactly how they will. And hopefully by um, enrolling yourself and doing a test enrollment, your keen eye is going to pick up any gaps or any errors in that process that you've started to build out. So that's ultimately why we recommend enrolling yourself so that you get to test all of that out. Um, now I do often see people get a bit hung up on using a real email address for test students. So if you are just process testing and it's not necessarily important that you receive the emails um, that might be sent, you can use just a fake email address. Don't let that scare you. Um, there is a setting you can turn on, which will allow your admin users to also set themselves up as student users. So that can be beneficial as well in that testing phase so that you can use the same email address, your work email address that you're logging into eSkilled with as an administrator, also as a student identity. And you can sort of see what that would look like from student end. Or alternatively, um, just use a personal email address. Lots of people will do that. Or you can set up a specific email account that you're just going to use uh, for the testing process to sort of make sure that the email workflow is working. So you've got confirmation email. You're getting all those reminders that you're expecting to receive. Um, I'd also recommend that you get other staff to undertake the same process um, because you can tend to have blinkers on a little bit as the person who's doing the setup and then also the testing. So if you can get some colleagues or family or friends to do a bit of a process test with you, sometimes they will pick up things that you have either, um, you know, not seen because you've been looking at it for too long, or maybe they'll just come at it with a new perspective, which can be really helpful too. Um, so if we investigate what enrolling yourself would be like in the system, um, it's sort of going to your iframe code and um, ultimately using that code to enrol yourself. So if you've already put it on your website and done step three, that is where you should do it from because that's what your students will be doing. You want to follow their journey and match that as much as possible. But um, if you just want to come at it from an admin end, there is a enrollment code no iframe button. That one is a link. So you can simply click on that and the link this time is copied to the clipboard. Uh, we can open that in a new tab, go and visit our little linky link and then follow that journey. Uh, 
and do what our students will do. Pick the uh, program that you would like to enroll into, the date you want to attend. Um, now, of course, this is going to rely on the fact that you've already set up your courses um, and then go through the motions here. Uh, pretend that you are a student. Um, maybe you are a test student. Um, use a celebrity name, use your children's name, um, you know, get creative with it if you like, but go through the motions and see what happens if you do try and submit the form, although you have not filled in all of the mandatory fields, because this is what students might do too and where they might have trouble. So if you go through that process as much as possible, exactly how they will, you'll have a really good understanding um, of what that is going to feel like and any obstacles they may come up across. So you can see if I do something silly like that, it's going to make it quite obvious which ones I haven't filled out and which ones are the mandatory ones that I have to fill out because they're circled in red. Um, so I did mention earlier that there are a couple of places that you can obtain the iframe code from or a link from. Uh, we've just been looking at the universal one, which is great because you can browse the entire library of training options that are available uh, and select which one you want to do. You can uh, generate that same code when you navigate into programs, when you navigate to program instances and uh, select an instance and open the details up. You'll see once you've opened that on the details page on the right side in the corner here, uh, you also have an external enrollment uh, link. This one with the little sideways arrows that represents HTML iframe code. So if you click on that, you can see it's letting me know that the iframe code was copied to the clipboard um, or this broken link icon here, that would be the direct link. So then the link is copied to the clipboard. Now, if you're using these links, um, they do behave just slightly differently. Um, you can see the first two options are now locked down. I can't interact with that and pick a different course or pick different delivery type. Um, so uh, because I've shared that directly from this particular program instance, all I've got the option to change here is the date of the training that I would like to attend. Um, and there's one more location you can actually grab these from too. Uh, I think you can get them at group level. So if you go to groups and were to open a particular group up, as you can see over here, um, again, you've got the iframe code and the direct link. And if you grab from this level, uh, all of those uh, drop down boxes are locked down. Uh, and in fact, I think that one's closed for enrollment, so I'm actually unable to enroll to any. Um, but yeah, if you just wanted to share a very specific date and time with a student or a particular group that you want them to enroll into, you've got the ability to do that too. Now, with that iframe code and how that might be useful is if you have a landing page on your website and it might say book now, you might want the student to be able to pick any training from your uh, scope of delivery. But you may also have a, a landing page for a particular course or a particular unit of competency or qualification. And then you might not want that page to necessarily divert the student off to your other offerings uh, where it might be nice that it was locked down. And so if I've landed on a page that was about CPR training, Maybe the only options you want the student to click on and see on that page are the CPR training options. So that's sort of where it comes into play um, is the way that you design your website. And, you know, that varies. People will do different things. Some people like having the option to choose from the full suite and some people do design a landing page for this, a landing page for that, and then you can just interact with that page and book into just that one piece of particular training you've selected on. Um, but enrolling yourself via the external enrollment form um, with, if you've done step three, put it on your website, do it via the website or use the direct link. Um, that's one great way to test what that student journey would be like. You can also, um, add a student into the system as well directly and then create the enrollment 
in the system too, like a, a manual enrollment by your administrators, uh, in which case you would just click the students menu item here um, and click add to add in the details of your student. And again, um, that would be your, you know, test student um, and then test student maybe um, so that you can keep a track of who they are. You may want to design that out as, yeah, a, a standard formatting, test student one, test student two, uh, really up to you, but definitely just encourage you to enroll yourself, enroll some tests and um, have a bit of a play with the system there and follow the student journey. All right, coming to our last point now. Um, uh, and I guess we sort of covered this, but that is the end goal. You want to make sure that you know what your students are actually doing when they follow your processes and identify anything that may need improvement before you go live. And the last thing that will set you up for success would be to run your event miss reports early. So uh, that may seem like a far off and uh, distant uh, time uh, will be February 2025 when those are due next because um, it's generally in February that the reporting is due for the previous calendar year. Um, it's good to be on top of these reporting requirements early though, uh, particularly if you're new, it's good to get comfortable and familiar with the process and how you do it. So I can't um, recommend enough that you do practice early and just know where to export your NAP files for the event miss reporting. Um, the biggest headache is always fixing any errors uh, because you do have to have an error-free report before you can submit that. So if you get in the habit or do a bit of a practice, if you're new, know how to export them and upload it to AVS to check for errors. That's going to mean um, ultimately that you have less stress when it comes to February and reporting time and you will feel prepared and you will know your data because you've already gone through the process nice and early, you've had a go and you know in theory what you need to do. And it will become easier um, as you go uh, because it is just the same thing that you do every year. Um, but it is really simple anyway from the eSkilled system. Um, I just do encourage you to have a bit of a practice mostly because of what we've got on screen there, stress less. Like if you've done it before, it's going to be that much less stressful um, and you're not going to be worried about it because you've already given it an attempt and how to go and not, you know, three days before the reporting deadline. So when it comes to generating your event miss reports, that's actioned via the administration menu and going into your settings. And it's the very first button here, just under your logo, you've got the event miss button. And that's how you generate an event miss report in the eSkilled system. So uh, you've got your start and end date and your type is already automatically set to national uh, for reporting to NCVER. Uh, so assuming that those are your um, period of reporting and who you are reporting to, uh, nothing needs to change here. All you will do is click on export um, and let it do its thing and download your data for you. Uh, that may take a little minute. There you go, didn't take too long. Obviously it depends on the volume of data because that's quite a small file realistically that it's generated there. So if you're not already familiar with the event miss data, um, it is in the form of a text file and it uh, is a zipped file with multiple um, plain text files within it. They are called NAT. Uh, at the front uh, and then you've got the, the numbers at the end. So if you are unfamiliar, what I have on screen is what they normally look like so that you can feel comfortable with the process. Um, and then what I'd recommend that you do is um, go to uh, AVS, so Event Miss Validation Software, uh, log in and run your data through their reports they will let you know if there are any errors with it. And then that would be your next project is to identify and fix any of those errors. Because as I mentioned, you must have 
an error-free data set in order to submit that successfully. So um, just to get you familiar with the process, I do recommend that you have a crack at it, run some data through and just see what comes back um, and do that before February in 2025 so that it's not stressful and so that you've already given that a red hot go and you've sort of seen what there is to see with that process. Um, it's good just to make sure that you've done that early so that, yeah, you take the stress out of it from yourself. But that's it for today. So we've covered off five things there that will set you up for success when you first get started with the system. So number one, create your people because creating your people means that everyone will have access to the system. They can have some buy-in and they can help you with setup. Build your email templates. Um, Sit down with the team, think about what those correspondence points are and get them going nice and early so that they're drafted and ready to use. And you can automate uh, a lot of those correspondence points too, but it does rely on having the templates written. So that's why I say templates first. Uh, utilize the iframe code on your website, particularly the enrollment iframe code so that you can easily accept student enrollments um, and then Following that, enrol yourself, follow the student journey, uh, see what they need to do and make sure that you understand it. You'll find anything that might be a gap. You'll be able to identify any missing correspondence, typos in your email templates that you've written, so on and so forth. So definitely put some test students through and um, get familiar with the process. And then finally, uh, run your event miss reports early. So particularly if you are um, new to um, RTO and reporting, it's good to just to run through the, the steps that you'll need to follow so that you know and you're comfortable with them uh, before the reporting deadline and it's not a stressful moment trying to get that done in February of 2025. Sit down and spend some time um, when you do have a little bit of time up your sleeve and make sure that you do know what the process is and how to do it from the eSkilled system. All right, so those were the five tips, thank you. Um, for attending today and if you do have any feedback we'd love to receive that. Um, we've got a survey link on screen there. There is also one that is sent out after the training um, with the recording so either one is fine um, but we'd love to have your feedback and uh, know how you felt this went today. Look forward to seeing you in our future webinars and uh, if you do have any questions uh, I should double check actually whether we did have any that came through. I don't see any. So if you think of anything after the session, um, you've got our contact points on screen there now. So feel free to shoot an email to our support team or give us a call and we'll be delighted to answer anything. But yeah, thank you for attending today and look forward to seeing you in our future webinars.